Live from downtown Detroit, home of WDIV and Click on Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Police body cam video shows officers putting handcuffs on an 11-year-old boy. His mother is now speaking out and filing a lawsuit. Doc? What to do if you're fully vaccinated but having symptoms of COVID? Plus, can you mix and match vaccines if you don't have any other choice? I'm Dr. Frank McGeorge. Coming up, I'm answering those questions and more about the vaccines. Imagine this happening on your street day and night. It's gotten so bad in one neighborhood in Detroit, people are afraid to go outside. We always see more of it when the weather warms up, of course. Drivers pulling stunts like donuts, drifting, and plain old speeding. And in one neighborhood, it's affecting people's daily lives. Victor Williams, live near the intersection of Manor and Pembroke. Uh, Victor, folks, there, you, they've, they've got to, they're afraid this has to, if this doesn't stop immediately, someone's going to get hurt. You can't do this on a residential street. Westside Detroit resident Miss Neal is fed up with the two streets surrounding her home being used as a drag strip and place for drivers to perform spin outs and donuts. They nearly hit my son yesterday and his father. They nearly hit my elderly neighbor. I mean, does someone have to actually die first before it stops? Drag racing and street drifting have become somewhat of a rising trend here in the city, with multiple videos surfacing of these drivers literally taking over the streets. It's gotten so out of hand that one driver lost control and ran into Miss Neal's fence just feet away from her home. To find out that someone did this, it really, really pissed me off because I'm such a quiet neighbor. Her frustrations are echoed by Casey Abram, who has lived on the block for decades. Terrible. When I've seen it, I put one and one together. You got your burnouts, donuts or whatever, and they ran into the lady fence. They're both praying something can be done before it's too late. The risk of hurting yourself, hurting someone else. We don't need this, Detroit. I'm not concerned for just myself. I'm concerned for the people driving the cars, because if they lose control, they're going to kill themselves. And it's kids everywhere. This is this have got to stop. Now shifting gears, we know that this activity is going to be increasing because of the weather, but DPD is going to be cracking down extremely hard. Now back in March, they introduced their illegal drifting and drag racing detail. And in just a few weeks since then, DPD, they have investigated over 1400 cars, issued more than 1800 citations, impounded over 117 vehicles and have had 36 vehicles forfeited over. So the bottom line is just don't do it. Save yourself the headache. Victor Williams. It's so frustrating to have it going through your neighborhood. All right, Victor. Well, the moments after a police chase on April 26th in Ypsilanti Township have become the center of a lawsuit by the family of an 11 year old boy. That boy had guns pointing at pointed at him and was also handcuffed for a few moments. Jason Colthorpe spoke to both the boy's mother and police on this and Jason, she understandably is angry. Very angry, Kim, because her son was pretty much scared to death, which you'll see here in a moment. Now what you need to know before seeing this is what happened just before this. There had been a shooting at the Briarwood Mall and Ann Arbor police were looking for a suspect vehicle. They found one, tried to pull it over, but that led to a high speed chase, which hit speeds of more than 100 miles per hour on the freeway and ended in uh, an open mall parking lot in front of the Kroger and Ipsy Township. This body cam is from Pittsfield Township Police who were assisting. Put the phone down now, sit. Lay down, lay down, lay down, put the phone down. Those commands are for an 11 year old boy who had just exited a vehicle involved in a police chase. Pittsfield Township Police say the officer's guns were drawn, but they holstered them as soon as they realized the boy was not a threat. It was terrifying for him. The boy's mother, Marquia Dixon, is blunt in her explanation of that day. Why do I think he went down his way? Because he's black. Are you okay? <laughs> it's fine. He's come off just as easy, all right? Are you okay? Yes, I'm okay. Police then handcuffed the boy for about a minute and 40 seconds. Why do you 
I was I was furious already for the handcuffs, but when I seen the video, it it, it, it broke my heart. I, I burst out crying, like it tore me apart. Pittsfield Township's police chief tells me he feels bad the boy was put in that situation, but it was unavoidable. That guns were drawn initially because they had to treat the boy as a shooting suspect, but then de-escalated as quickly as they could. Why would he have a gun? He had his phone in his hand, y'all. You can see it in the video. Why would you put handcuffs on an 11-year-old? I understand what the dad did was wrong, but that doesn't justify what they did to my kid. After that, what you don't see on the tape is officers allowing him to call his mom, and they even got him something to drink. Now, as it turns out, the boy's father was not involved in that other shooting, but he did have outstanding warrants, which is why he took off. Police say the only reason this boy ended up in harm's way is because his father did not just pull over and instead led them on a dangerous chase that included weaving in and out of traffic on I-94. Kimberly? Yeah. Okay, Jason, thanks. Today marks one year since the death of George Floyd. The tragedy set in motion months of protests and reflection about the state of racial justice in America. George Floyd's family is back in Washington today meeting with lawmakers. You see them here with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. We've got video also of them arriving at the White House for a meeting with President Biden. They are pushing for the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act to become law a reform bill that is currently stuck in the Senate. One of the most important questions we can ask in George Floyd's memory is how has policing changed since his murder? Many police departments have reevaluated their methods. Local 4 defender Sean Lay is live with a look at what's changed over this past year. Sean? There have been some changes and maybe for some not enough changes. So late today in Lansing, the state legislature offered 12 new bipartisan bills that would change policing big time for every officer, every department in this state and every citizen who comes in contact with a police officer. Also, we're speaking with a Detroit law enforcement expert. This man fought in Vietnam. He policed Detroit streets. He says he has never seen anything like the killing of George Floyd. But here's a person who we actually watched die. Former Detroit Police Chief Ike McKinnon had never seen anything like the death of George Floyd when Officer Derek Chauvin forced his knee on Floyd's neck. We have a great number of people throughout the world who witnessed this and said, my God, you know, this is probably the worst that they had ever seen. McKinnon says the protests that followed have changed policing forever from Detroit police mandating that it is an officer's duty to report if they see a fellow officer breaking rules and laws to Livonia police sending mental health pros to mental health calls changes that were unheard of when McKinnon was being trained to be an officer. Literally, uh, this is the term that they use and we'll probably beep it out is a kick ass. But, you know, we have to realize that you just can't do that. In every instance. What's more, state legislators are now pushing a dozen police reform bills to eliminate police chokeholds, no knock warrants, and require de escalation training. Here's Detroit State Senator Stephanie Chang saying these reforms would be laws so police and citizens know what to expect statewide. Everywhere you go, you should know exactly what um, you know the minimum standards are going to be when it comes to use of force. Back here live, Senator Chang also telling me that she wants some of these bills to go forward that would ensure every single officer has de-escalation training and implicit bias training to go along with those no chokeholds, no knock warrants. All this gets going in Lansing on Thursday. There will be debate and testimony about it. She is hoping it moves forward quickly. We're live tonight. Sean Lane, Local 4. Thing. All right, Sean. Now to the latest coronavirus numbers. The state reports 739 new cases in the last 24 hours. It's the first single day report of less than 1,000 cases since March 9th. Sadly, though, we've lost another 66 Mich Michiganders to the virus, including 31 from a review of vital records. That pushes the state's total deaths to more than 19,000 since the start of the pandemic. With new information and guidelines coming out every day, we know viewers have a lot of questions. Our Dr. Frank McGeorge is back to answer more of your questions submitted through clickondetroit.com. Doc. Yeah, Kim. So a viewer named Nick asks, if you've been fully vaccinated but feel as though you may have a mild case, what should you do and how long would it last? Well, Nick, breakthrough infections are possible. If you're vaccinated but experiencing COVID symptoms, you should get tested and stay home to avoid infecting others until your test results come back. 
There's no way to know how long your symptoms will last, but in a mild case, they'll likely resolve quickly. Now here are some more of your questions. A viewer asks, can I mix and match vaccines? I had an AstraZeneca vaccine in Mexico on April 9th. I'm now in the States and can't get an AstraZeneca second shot. Which vaccine should I get and when? This is not an uncommon question. In fact, there have been a couple of studies looking at a dose of the Pfizer vaccine after a single AstraZeneca dose. One preliminary study spaced the doses out by two weeks and found an excellent response. Another study suggested spacing the two shots out by 12 weeks might reduce side effects. My recommendation would be to get the Pfizer vaccine as your second shot, and now that you're six weeks out, I would say any time is great. Eileen writes, I got both of my shots. Each time I received my shot, it burned and my arm started itching and it turned a little red. Is that normal? A reaction near the injection site is not uncommon, and if you have it with the first shot, according to a recently published paper in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, there's a 43% chance that you will have a similar reaction with the next dose. The same study found large skin reactions that occurred more than seven days after the first shot were far more common in women and with the Moderna vaccine. Importantly, they did not find any long-term problems and the rashes resolved on their own. Now finally, another viewer asks, why are colleges making this vaccine mandatory for a virtually safe group of people? So while college students do have a lower risk of becoming seriously ill or dying, they have played a big role in spreading the virus because they tend to be more social and less cautious. With most colleges planning to have students back on campus and back in dorms in the fall, getting vaccinated will dramatically reduce the risks of outbreaks. Back to you. Great information as always. Doc, we appreciate it. The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services is partnering with the Protect Michigan Commission to launch a new text message initiative. Program will begin tomorrow. Its goal is to share COVID-19 vaccine information and encourage Michiganders to get vaccinated, particularly those in vulnerable communities. Those who don't want to receive any more text messages can reply with the word stop. Key member of the UAW's leadership team is moving on. UAW Vice President Gerald Kareem announced his retirement today. He replaced the current UAW President Rory Gamble as UAW Vice President and the Director of the UAW Ford Department back in January of 2020. He's worked with Ford throughout the pandemic to implement COVID-19 safety protocols for UAW members in factories. Kareem is going to serve through June 30th. Still ahead, a pair of beloved summertime events have just been uncanceled as COVID restrictions are eased. We'll have that coming up in just a minute. Let's check in with Ben. Devin and Kim, we had that strong southwest wind today that brought in temperatures near a record. Tomorrow, that same breeze is going to start bringing in the moisture. We need that, but we may not need what's coming with it. We'll look at our storm threat for Wednesday next. Rodman, Brown, Hamilton. You can add Jackson, Billick, and Edmondson to the list. I'll explain next on Local 4.